Who's been enjoying the event so far today? You're supposed to make some noise. You're supposed to show me your energy at 5 o'clock. So because it's 5 o'clock, we'll go through this pretty quickly. This is a talk that I put together uh, earlier this year called Because You Can Run, You Can't Hide. Uh, I don't know if the talk is as interesting as the title, but this was a case where a really good title covers up for maybe so-so content. OK, so before we get started, we're at Pi Data Delhi. It's Saturday, August 3rd, 2019. I'm James. If you like this talk or you're interested in this kind of material, you can follow me on Twitter at Don't Use This Code. Uh, and let's get started. Now, usually when somebody starts their talk, they talk about their own background. They work in this, they work in that. Other than to say that I serve on the board of NumFocus. I serve as co-chair. I'm also vice president of Pi Data. It is my absolute pleasure to be here for the third year in a row. I don't think there's that much that I can tell you about myself that will be very interesting, except that my background may be very different than many of yours. I don't come from a deep learning background. I don't come from a machine learning background. I come from a scientific or numeric computing background. And then that's what actually drew me to Python originally. It's more specifically, I come from a background in the finance industry building tools that have some scientific or numeric analysis component that serve some front office or quantitative analysis objective. Now, in that sense, the attraction for Python for us is to use Python as a glue language. What that means is somebody saw 10 years ago wrote some model code in C or C++, and we don't really want to interact with that model code in C or C++, but through the ease of building Python FFI bindings, we can wrap that code in Python, and we can give our users some code that is a little bit more friendlier to interact with than C or C++. More specifically, our goal here is to take some existing code, to adapt it, to wrap it, and to take some existing API and to provide that API to a Python user and maybe a more native or friendlier approach. Now, one of the reasons why we might choose Python, and this is in comparison to the original model code in C++, we don't have to deal with core dumps, we don't have to deal with malloc and free. If this original code is in C, C in, very, in many ways is a very primitive language without modules, without namespacing, and so Python gives us a much easier, friendlier way to build these APIs. And you know, oftentimes, when we look at some of these things like less namespacing, they don't really mean a whole lot. Usually, it just means less typing. But I think one of the core things is also that when you're working with Python code, it's very easy to work in an iterative mode. It's easy to work introspectively. And that's something that can be very difficult to do in C or C++. As an example, a long time ago, I was trying to investigate one of the libraries uh, for interacting with Git repositories, libgit2. And it's a C library, and, I, and it has Python bindings. And I found that I actually wanted to interact with this on a flight. And I didn't have internet access on the flight. So all I had was a download of libgit2 and pygit. And I found it was much easier for me to understand the underlying C library by working through the Python bindings than to write a little bit of C code, compile it, see what happens, write a little bit of C code, compile it. Because the introspective capabilities of C and C++ are very poor. For, in Python, we all have this example that if you're given a hard, if you're given a problem, no matter how hard it is, you can always kind of iterate your way to a solution by just digging around and looking around. And that's something that we'll see come up in a bit. Now, one of the things that I see often in the work that I do is people who are data scientists or natural scientists, there's a big question of why bother to learn Python? Instead, you know, I just have some library. I'm writing some analysis or application. Let me just learn NumPy. Let me just learn Pandas. I'll learn Py, I'll learn PyTorch. I'll learn TensorFlow. But there's no real value for me learning the core language. I do a lot of corporate training. And when I do corporate training, when certain topics come up, you can see the attention of the audience kind of evaporate. They're not, they don't really care about things like classes. They don't care about decorators. And they wonder, how is this even relevant to me? Unless it's me learning a new library like PyMC3 or Keras, what's the value? Well, it turns out that in a lot of our work, as we progress in our career, this dichotomy of a language versus analysis and application it gets a little bit deeper, and we start off doing some analysis and application, just working with the tail end tools, just working with NumPy or Pandas or Keras or TensorFlow. And then at some point, we realize that in order to accelerate our career, our best bet is to accelerate the work of our peers. And so instead of working on one specific analysis, we work on a library that our users, our peers, use to power their analysis. And as we move along our career, we may push ourselves higher and higher up this hierarchy until you know, at some point, we may be writing some very core abstract library, a library like NumPy or Arrow, that on top of which our, our peers are writing their own libraries, on top of which, down the hierarchy, there are other people who are writing actual analyses and applications. And so when we find ourselves in that circumstance, we see that we immediately have a necessity to do API design. This is one area where a lot of the tools in Python, if we look at them from a modern lens, are, are quite lacking. For example, 
If I were to ask you about the quality of Matplotlib's API, I think you would rate it as being fair to poor. And one of the reasons for that, that I think makes this an unfair judgment, is that Matplotlib is a very old library. It's been around for a very long time. In some cases, if you look at the Matplotlib API, you might ask, why are there setters and getters? We don't do that in Python. Well, the reason that there are setters and getters in the Matplotlib API is because Matplotlib predates property. Matplotlib predates a lot of the things that we take for granted in modern Python. And so when we look at some of the APIs of some of these older tools, we can see, yes, they are admittedly somewhat poor because they predate a lot of what we consider to be contemporary Python. However, with that said, if you look at the, the APIs of a lot of modern libraries, like PyMC3, things that have only come up together in the last few years, they're fully using all of the metaphors and features provided by Python. You have very nice, very rich APIs that are, are very Pythonic as to how we conceptualize contemporary Python. Now, when we go back to this question of why Python, because we could choose a lot of different languages for, for wrapping some code. We have some C or C++ library, we could choose any, any language. Or we could choose to use something like Swig, and we could automatically generate wrappings where effectively it doesn't matter if the code is in Python, it all looks like the underlying C or C++ code, it's just that you don't have semicolons at the end of the line. Why actually choose to focus on API design in Python? Well, the reason for that is, when you're embarking upon the design process of building a library, there's effectively two pieces that you have to consider. One of them are the metaphors that are available in the language that you're using, and the other one are the mechanisms that are available in that language. And one of the things that a lot of contemporary users of Python find is that Python is very rich in terms of the metaphors and mechanisms it provides to you. When I say metaphors and mechanism, by metaphor, I typically mean some system, some piece of technology that's provided to the user. I mean something in contrast to a mechanism that's provided to the library author. In other words, when I say metaphor, I mean something in Python like calling a function. These are things that we take for granted these days. But if you really go back in time to Fortran, early days of C, you know, even APIs that are based around calling functions are a contemporary, are a contemporary manifestation of tools that we did not have 30 or 40 years ago. Even functionality like keyword arguments that we take for granted in Python didn't exist as something that you could just take for granted in the language 20 years ago or earlier. And so when you look at a lot of Python libraries, especially those that originated when Python first became popular in say like the late 90s, early 2000s, the metaphors that they employ tend to be fairly minimalistic. But those were actually very surprising metaphors for the time. This kind of class and functions with keyword arguments metaphor was a big step up from the original C. Now, modern Python gives you a little bit more than just keyword arguments, it gives you and gives you a little bit more than just namespaces. It gives you, you know, custom functions and, and API around functions, a data model. It gives you fancy things like generators and context managers. And newer APIs are beginning to use this to a greater degree. But originally, when you look at the metaphors provided by Python, there were quite few. And as Python advances, as we overwhelm the language with more features, we get a richer set of metaphors, a richer way to express what we're doing. In the case of context managers, if you think about, say, the PyMC3 API, PyMC3 API uses this in order to create a model. And so conceptually, there's some mechanism there of how the context manager works, but there's also some metaphor that they're trying to, that they're trying to convey to the user. They're trying to say, there's some code that belongs to a model. This code is structured under this model. There's some hierarchy. And there's some implicit context in which this operates where these lines of code only apply to this context. This context has some kind of setup. This context has some kind of teardown. And there's a little bit more than just the underlying mechanism of enter and exit. When we talk about mechanisms in Python, we often talk about things that are provided to the library user, conveniences that make it easy to actually manage a library. And historically, Python has not really focused that much on this. You can see a lot of work recently where the library author perspective is taken to be a core perspective for how the design of the language evolves. For example, one of the original metaphors that we have or one of the original mechanisms that were provided to library authors in Python are star args and star star quarks. Something that today we take for granted, but if you really think about how variadic arguments work in C, it's incredibly clumsy and incredibly painful. And the kinds of APIs, the kind of convenience APIs that you can write in C, can't match up to the kind of convenience APIs you write in Python. When you look at the help text for a pandas function or a matplotlib function, what do you typically see? A couple of named arguments, especially in the help text, and a star star quark. Why? Because those two libraries tend to be orientated in terms of conveniences written on top of some core mechanism. In the case of matplotlib, it's the, the uh, draw graph. In the, in the case of pandas, it's the pandas data frame. And you have these layers of conveniences to actually make it so that 
complex operations only take one line of code and they have very meaningful and well-chosen conventional defaults. And it's through a mechanism like star arguments that they say, look, instead of creating a dependency between the convenience layer and the underlying implementation layer, we'll just allow the convenience layer to say, take some extra arguments that get passed to the underlying implementation layer, and we won't have to worry about maintaining that relationship between the two, where you would have to worry about that in C and C++. A mechanism we may take for granted, something that's very powerful. Now, as Python evolves, we see things like star, this, this single star representing positional only arguments. And you can think this is something of a API author's dream. Because when you are writing code and your users are using your code, the worst thing to have happen is you make some change in that library layer, and that requires your users to change their code. And so when that happens, and you'll see as we go deeper in this talk, that's part of the goal of what we try to avoid with some of these mechanisms. When that happens, you end up getting a lot of really cranky users saying, my code worked yesterday, I upgraded, it no longer works today, why did you break something that wasn't broken? And as a library author, you feel very constrained because there may be meaningful changes that you want to make in terms of how that implementation works that you're not able to because you're afraid of their, what the users do. In the case of something like positional only arguments, this is one way that you can prevent your users from fixing the order of the arguments they pass to some underlying function by saying these can only be passed, sorry, keyword only. Because they can only be passed keyword only, you can do things like push things off into KWR, you can rearrange the order of these. With positional only arguments, you can do the same. You can force that somebody doesn't accidentally use a keyword for a keyword that you didn't mean, you didn't intend to have meaning. And you can force your users in a particular direction so that they don't create code that then breaks when you need to change something about the underlying implementation. Now, one of the core things that a library author tries to do in order to keep their life sane is to provide some, to create some kind of information hiding, to hide certain details from the end user and to make it so that the end user interacts with a fairly narrow surface area of the underlying project. The reason for that is if you provide the entire implementation to, or if you make the entire implementation of that library available to the under, to, to the end user, then they're going to find some behavior in that implementation. They're going to write some code that exploits that behavior. They're going to find some API or some function that you never intended for them to call. They're going to call that function. You're going to change the underlying implementation. And then they're going to complain on GitHub. You broke my code. Why'd you break my code? And so in Python, there's this desire to do some kind of information. Hiding. When I do corporate training, one of the big users, one of the big audiences in corporate training that I do, tend to be um, non-professional programmers. And so these are people who manage to have picked up some C or C++. They never call themselves programmers. They are network engineers or optical engineers or something along that. And so their conceptualization is heavily, heavily uh, influenced by the first language that they learn. When that first language is C++ or Java, this topic of information hiding comes up because they ask, why doesn't Python have private and public and friends and protected? And it's something that they try to coerce into Python. And what we're going to do in this talk, we're going to look at this specific component of the mechanisms of metaphor provided by Python and really go deep into why Python doesn't have information hiding mechanisms and what that really means. Now, when we talk about information hiding, we're often talking about a couple of different things. And so I'll use this very loosely to refer to encapsulation and consciousness. Effectively, there's some information in some layer of the code that we're writing that we want to hide from our end users because we either want to have the freedom to change it later or we just don't want them to deal with that layer. We want to have a very narrow surface area that they interact with. And so an example is you provide some API. In that API, there's some function. You anticipate that they call that function. Now, when you look at the underlying API, the, the underlying API has some implementation. And that's some implementation that you want to be feel free to change anytime you want to change that. You may find that originally this API provided three functions and the implementations were all separate and then at some point you might want to unify them or vice versa. And inevitably, when you do something like this, you're going to find somewhere in your user's code somebody did this. They found the implementation detail, they imported it, and they called it directly. And this is going to break the moment that implementation changes because that implementation you, know, you might change the arguments that are passed to it, you might break that one function into two, you might rename that function. And you might assume that because it has an underscore at the beginning, that's enough. That says keep away. But they didn't keep away. They pierced this veil, and they did something that will eventually work against their interests when you change the implementation. Now, when you see an example like this, one of the motivations that I see is often, how do I stop this? Maybe there's a more sophisticated technique that I can use to 
hide my implementation details from somebody. Maybe there's maybe there is a way in Python to do information hiding. Now you're fighting a losing battle because Python is a very powerful introspective language, and so in Python you have things like get source from inspect, and so there's always the ability that if you're shipping somebody .py files, they're going to do a get source on the code, and they're going to see what that implementation is, and they're going to kind of pierce that veil. Similarly, so they might just do a get source on that function, and they'll see what that implementation is, and so even if you bury this deep in some source code, there's always some runtime introspective technique that they can use to go and find what actually happened behind the scenes. Similarly, if you just provide them with, say, the bytecode, they can take that bytecode and they can disassemble it, and they can kind of see and peek on what's going on behind the scenes. Or even, it turns out, uh, earlier this year, uh, there was a new decompiling library written for Python. It turns out it's very easy to take Python bytecode and decompile it back to Python source code. And the Python source code that you get, it's even better than when you do this against Java. And so even if, for whatever reason, you just manage to ship bytecode to people, it doesn't matter. They can reconstruct so a lot of details of what the original source code looked like, and from that, figure out what happened behind the scenes. Fairly difficult to do. Now that said, let's talk about a more narrow problem. Let's say you have some API and it has some internal state. And you don't want people to touch that internal state, so you put an underscore at the beginning. But you know your Wiley users are going to do a DIR on this API module, and they're going to find it. And that underscore is going to make them even more curious than they would be otherwise. And because they're more curious, they're going to go and they're going to muck around with this. And they're going to create some dependency that will, in the end, result in a very angry comment on GitHub saying, why did you break this? You broke my code. Why do you have to make this change? Now, you as a library author might say, you know what? I'm going to play a little trick. I'm going to use a property, this, this property feature in Python, this mechanism that's provided to me. And what I'll do is I'll hide, I'll hide that underscore method behind a property. And so in the interaction, you know, somebody's going to try and do a.x here, and they won't be able to set this state. They'll think that they can set this x variable, but because it's a property with no corresponding setter, with only a getter, this will fail. But somebody's just going to do a dir on that object and they're find the underscore attribute, and they're just going to change their code from this to this. And there's not much you can do. They're going to pierce that veil immediately. Now, when they do that, you may, you may feel like, you may feel challenged. You may feel spiteful towards you. You may think, you know what? This is an arms race and I'll always win. And so you may say, can I dig deeper? Is there a way that I can go even deeper than this and I can prevent you from piercing this veil? And so you might try to do something a little bit more complex. You might say, you know what? What I'll do is you found this, uh, this underlying state by doing a DIR. I'll make it harder for you to find it. So what I'll do is, I'll hide the underlying state in this x variable behind a lambda, and I'll set that lambda in the init, and then in the property, I'll call this function. And so if you do a, a naive dir, and then you do a help on everything that you see in that dir, and you poke around, it'll be harder for you to find this, because this x is hidden in the const that's hidden in the closure of this lambda. And so you, know, you can still do this get x, but when you try and do the set, it doesn't work. But then somebody's going to realize, because they can see your source code, how you implemented this mechanism, and they're just going to swap out the lambda. And so, again, there's some technique where, given that source code, they're going to look at the source code, and they're going to figure out how you implemented this hiding mechanism, and they're going to subvert it. Now, given that, they can go even more surgically than that, because if they're a Python user, they may do DIR, and they may start doing DIR on things that they're not supposed to do DIR on, like the closure, and they'll go into the closure cell contents. The first is, in exchange for having such a rich runtime, in exchange for having such a powerful set of tools to introspect and to iterate on code, everything exists. And everything could be found, and everything can be found very easily. So as long as you can get a running Python process, and you can put a breakpoint somewhere in that running Python process, you can dig around with enough DIR and enough use of the inspect module and find anything you want to find and change anything you want to change. And so because of Python's very rich runtime, everything exists, everything is visible, almost everything can be either changed or copied, and it can all be done with a very small investment in sophistication. If you try to apply some of these techniques to a C binary, like you can read the assembly of a C binary, but you need a very high degree of sophistication to work through the, the tedium of actually understanding all of the assembly that corresponds to a single, like a megabyte C binary. There's too much assembly for you to read through. You can't really interact with it very easily uh, under a runtime setting. GDB, you can kind of play with a little bit. If you have to be really good at GDB, you have to have a very strong investment in your 
and the sophistication of the approaches you're taking to mess around with that. If you ever try to like crack the license protection of a piece of commercial software, you can see that it doesn't take a lot of sophistication on the author's side to make it fairly difficult for just a naive user to find the patch point and the patch out license functions. Whereas in Python, because of its rich runtime, this ends up being a very, very easy thing to do. I once did a uh, project where I was extending the Python interpreter to add security transparency features. And I had to give a lot of presentations to the client who wanted this. And one of the things that I reiterated to them was, and we'll see this as we go deeper in this example, pretty much any attempt to look around a running Python interpreter to find things you're not supposed to find, to mutate things you're not supposed to mutate, can be done by a motivated grad student. This is not C, this is not C++, there's not this esoteric knowledge of assembly and how the processor works. In Python, the C Python source code is very easy to read. You probably need to be like a second year undergraduate to read through the C Python source code. To, to run C Python under debugger and to do things you're not supposed to do does not take a very high level of sophistication. This is what makes Python such an easy language to learn, such an easy language to write bindings against, such a fun language for me to play with, but it makes it very difficult to accomplish this information hiding. So going back to the information hiding, let's say you try and go a little bit deeper. Instead of hiding this in the closure of that Lambda, you'll hide it even deeper. You'll create this getx, you'll bind it, so it's hidden in this, it's hidden in the const of this function, which is hidden behind the property, then you'll delete that out of the scope, so they can't even do a DIR and find it. So it's hidden in a place where people won't really look. But again, because Python has this rich runtime, because it has these introspective tools, you can dig around and you can find the thing that you weren't supposed to find. So you can dig around into this thing, you can go into the function defaults, you can find the code object for that, you can find the code consts for that. You can dig around enough and without needing a lot of upfront sophistication. You don't have to understand what these pieces mean. You don't have to understand what these are. You just have to sit at your interactive console, do DIR, see something interesting, see what's in it, do DIR again, see what's in it, and just keep doing that for an entire afternoon until you find the thing that you want. So it reduces the sophistication for this. Now, in this particular case, you can't set the code consts on a Python function. This is one case where the Python interpreter actually does enforce read only. There are very few cases where you can, where the Python interpreter actually enforces read only. And in the case of the actual cons for a code object, that is, that is what happens. But one of the other things about Python is because it has such a rich runtime, it's very easy to copy things. And so if you wrote some code that looked like this, this just takes an existing function. And instead of mutating something that you can't mutate, it just makes a copy of it with the mutated thing swapped out. And this, again, this is a lot of code here, but really, this is just the result of doing a bunch of DIRs and spending an hour or two trying to figure out all the, all the things that you pass there to this code type. Because you can dynamically create a new function at runtime, you can take a function that you want to change that in the rare case, the C Python interpreter enforces as being read only and just make a copy of it subject to the changes that you want. And so if you combine all of these together and you want to get past this last level of hack, what you would do is you'd go into the code cons, you'd swap out the constant object, You'd go into the underlying function, you'd swap out the default argument that bounds that underlying function. Then you go into the property, you'd swap out that property, and all together would look something like this, and you would defeat even this third level of this mechanism. Now, if we go deeper and deeper into this mechanism, it just adds more layers to how much you have to patch out, and it just adds a little bit more time and a little bit more frustration. But here's the important thing. There is one library author who's doing all of this work trying to hide this information, and there are thousands of users spread throughout the world communicating on Stack Overflow, asking each other questions on Slack. You are overwhelmed by the effort that your users can have to subvert the mechanisms that you do to control them. And so even if one individual user might not be able to come up with this sequence of operations, there's going to be somebody out there who will come up with it and they'll post it on Stack Overflow and everybody will copy from there. Yeah. And surprisingly enough, this is actually the safe and easy way to do this. It turns out that the situation in Python is, is even, even more interesting than we thought. Now, before we get into the really hard way to do this surgically, I want to reiterate that that approach that I showed you is not hard. And to say that this is not hard is not hubris. It's not to say, oh, you know, you can dig around in this. It's to say that any sufficiently motivated grad student is going to just sit at their console for a whole afternoon. Grad students have more time than anything. Their time is absolutely worthless. They don't need to sleep. They don't need to eat. They don't need, they don't even get paid enough. They'll just sit there. Their professor will tell them, make this happen and they will make it happen. And so they don't need to know a lot about Python. They don't need to know a lot about programming. They'll just dig and dig and dig. And because Python makes it so easy to introspect, this 
obscure combination of operations, they may not be able to get the tersest version of it, but they will find a way to do this. And it is, it is simply not hard. It is hard for maybe somebody in the audience to come up with it off the top of their head. But trust me, if you were tasked with breaking this information hiding mechanism that I'm, I'm positing as being one of the more sophisticated ones out of the three approaches we've seen so far, you will do it if you're given enough time. It may take you an entire afternoon. It may take you a week, but it's not going to be something that is strictly outside of your capabilities. Now, if you want something really interesting, I'll show you a, a, a sufficiently a sufficiently more su a surgical approach to this. It turns out that tuples in Python aren't really immutable. Now that should be a shock to you because this is one of the few areas where Python, where the Python interpreter supposedly tells us that you know we're enforcing immutability. It is true that I'm not going to show you any Python code that actually mutates tuple. Not quite. Um, it, it's obvious the case that if you do something like this, this will fail. You can't do that. Python tuples, from within Python code, if you try and change the tuple, it'll say, I'm sorry, I won't do that. It is the case that if you write code that looks like this, I would try this when you get home. This will, this will say it failed, but it will actually succeed. So it'll do the worst of both worlds. This will actually change the uh, list. That's this, the second element of this tuple. Tell you it wasn't able to change that, but when you look at it, it actually made the amendment. So I, can, I don't know, if it's, is it worse for it to tell you it succeeded, but it actually failed? Or is it worse for it to tell you it failed, but it actually succeeded? I think maybe they're both equivalent to that. What I'm talking about is related to something that we discovered la early last year. Very interesting that we discovered when looking at Python being used in secure environments. It turns out that if you look at a simple function like this in Python, and you disassemble this function, you get some disassembly here, and you can see that Python bytecode is very straightforward. There's almost no optimizations applied to it. There's no, in CPython, there's no JIT. This is more or less the simplest bytecode. This is what you'd come up with if you were you know, a second or third year undergraduate student trying to create an interpreter. This is what gives Python such a leg up in terms of creating a very large community of contributors to CPython because it's so easy. It has a lot of downsides in that CPython is very difficult to optimize. And you know, there's, there's a lot of issues with using CPython at scale given the simplicity of the underlying interpreter and the unwillingness to add significant complications to that works. With that said, I want to show you something kind of interesting. If you look at that first bytecode that's used, this load fast, this is the bytecode that represents the loading of a local variable in Python. Now, here's that in the C Python interpreter. This is the target word. And you can see on the very first line here, there's a macro called get local. And if you look at that macro, you can see it does an array lookup. Does it bounds check this array lookup? Let's see where that argument came from. That argument was one of the things that was passed in the bytecode. So given this, that inside this uh, Python interpreter, there is an array lookup that's not bounds checked, and the array index is provided by the user in terms of the bytecode. What that means is you can write poison Python bytecode that does arbitrary array axes in Python. And so this is what we did last year. I'll show you the example that uh, my colleague Joe Jekyll came up with. It's called tuple set item. And it's quite straightforward. One of the amazing things about this is there is no C code here whatsoever. This is all pure Python code, and it only relies on a couple of simple assumptions. One, that they haven't added bounds access, they haven't added bounds checks to uh, this uh, macro, which they probably won't because that would add a significant overhead to every local variable lookup. Two, that you have the ability to dynamically create code, which is something that is used throughout the standard library, so that's kind of hard to lock down. And three, that the ID function gives you the memory address of something. So all you do is you dynamically create a function with two to the 16th branches. And then you repeatedly create that function until it's within spitting distance, within two to the 16 bytes of the memory you want to modify. You figure out how far away that function is from the memory you want to modify. And you pass in a generator that will go down those branches until you modify a local variable that doesn't really exist that corresponds to the memory address that you want to mutate, and you go and you mutate the memory address. And so this allows you to mutate a tuple in place with no C code whatsoever by just noticing that a simple Python bytecode like load fast does an unbounded array access, and you can poison that bytecode to tell it to do arbitrary writes to memory. Now, that was quite surprising when we discovered it. However, with that said, it turns out that the situation here is not, these kind of hacks are not, are not as Python specific as you might think. They are very meaningful. I mean, this kind of sophistication is quite meaningful because some research has been done recently and a lot of industrial activity 
is popping up recently in terms of running Python in a secure execution context. Imagine that you're running Python in a Docker container as PID1, and there's nothing else running in that Docker container, and that Docker container potentially provides some API, some REST API, and somebody goes, somebody subverts that REST API to get execution inside the container. Inside that container, because you have your process running as PID1, you don't have to put anything inside that container. That container can just have a Python executable and just your, your, your application. If a user manages to get execution in that container, they can start to, because they have a Python interpreter, they can bring in Python code. They can run arbitrary Python code. They can use that arbitrary Python code to look around that container, perhaps to exfiltrate data from that container. Maybe that container contains secure government data or secure healthcare data to look at API keys, to make accesses across the network. And so a lot of work has been put into uh, PET 551 and PET 570 something or other, which are about adding features to Python to lock it down in the secure execution context. And some of these attacks are about how you can then subvert them. Now, with that said, it turns out that this is not something that is uniquely problematic to Python. Because it turns out that if you're running code on Linux and you have the ability to run code within a process, you can do anything you want. It turns out that on Linux, you almost certainly have a proc file system available to you. And you can see all of these are all the processes that are running on my system. So you can see, see all the PIDs of all the processes running on my system. There's a symlink here, self. So this is the actual current process it's running. So this is the LS process. Inside, inside this folder, there's a maps and mem. Maps represents all the memory mappings for this process. So you can see this is a less process. You can see the actual binary. You can see all the shared libraries that it loads. And it turns out that there's something really problematic here. Take a look at the permissions of maps. If you can read write. If you go into the Python kernel and you look at how the proc file system is implemented, you can see this is where the proc file system mem is. This represents your virtual memory. This is where those operations are defined. If we dig a little bit, we can see this is where the read write handling, reading writing into this, this, uh, device is. And you can see that there is no checking for the permissions on the page itself. There is only checking for the permissions on the file. In other words, any arbitrary Linux process can arbitrarily read and write from its own virtual memory space, completely ignoring write execute permission, like write XOR execute permissions, completely ignoring any permissions that you put on that page. And so an example of that is quite easy to put together in Python. Here you have some Python byte string and you have some other value. And what you can do is you can have your Python process read its memory maps, parse its memory maps to figure out where the actual allocated memory is so it avoids page faults. And then it go through those memory maps to find something that it wants to mutate and go and mutate that. What that means is for the first attack that I showed you, where you're completely defeating any, any information hiding mechanism by mutating something that you shouldn't even be able to mutate. The requirement was fairly complex, that ID behaves a certain way, that the interpreter has not been passed in a certain way, that you're able to actually create this function within a certain distance of this other function. There were a lot of pre presumptions, and those presumptions to a large degree are CPython folks. What it turns out is, if you're running a process on Linux, it doesn't matter what language it's written in, as long as that process can read and write to files, it can read and write to its own virtual memory. So any piece of information within that process is visible to any code running under that process. Private, public, protected, they don't exist and they don't matter. They are mechanisms that are provided by the compiler to guide you towards more correct code, but they are not strict information hiding mechanisms. In other words, if you create a, an application and you have some plugin mechanism where I can write code as a plugin that runs under your process space, I can do anything I want outside of the API that you give me, outside of the bonds, as long as you allow me to open a file, read from a file, and write from a file, which almost certainly you wouldn't lock down. And so this goes to show something very interesting. It goes to show the core idea behind information hiding as a security mechanism is flawed. As long as you are within a process, process privileges within Linux are so weak, the boundary is very stark around the process, but within the process, there is no boundary. All of these mechanisms that we think that we have in Java or C++ that we think that we can kind of try to create in Python, they don't exist. 
You can read and write from your virtual memory to your heart's degree. You can find anything that's inside your own virtual memory. You can mutate that as long as you can find it. Maybe you have to be a little bit sophisticated in order to mutate that surgically, but there is no strict security-wise protection. Instead, what you have are non you have the situation where the API that you're providing, if it includes some kind of information hiding, if it has public or, or private, if it's trying to hide some information using that underscore convention that we have in Python, it's because that API is not fully programmatic. These are not programmatic mechanisms for stopping people from reading information. Instead, they are social mechanisms. In other words, when you think about the creation of the software product, it's necessarily a human construction. To put it in other terms, if you think about any of the mechanisms you're providing in the software development process, there's some spectrum, some automation spectrum between work that's done by the machine and work that's done by a human being. In a, in a typed language, a lot of work is done by the machine to ensure the correctness of your code. In an untyped language, a lot of work is done by a human being to create unit tests, to create, to, to test it manually, to validate it by reading through it. And there's some balance between these two. The mechanism that we focused on for information hiding have strictly been automated mechanisms, mechanisms enforced and created by the machine. But we can see, given this underlying principle for how the Linux virtual machine works, those mechanisms are not strictly correct. They are not strong mechanisms. They can always be subverted. And so whenever you consider the API and the construction of that API and information as part of that API, you're always necessarily relying on some human element. The machine element is not sufficient to strictly hide that information. In other words, if you provide your user with an API that has a load data call, and you provide your user with an API that has a clean data call, and you provide some nice functions with dtypes, and there's some process data, and you're doing a code review, and in the middle of all of this very normal code using your API, you see this. That doesn't pass the code review. It doesn't matter that they can do this. It matters that even though the machine mechanism, the mechanisms provided by Python were not able to stop somebody from piercing this veil of information hiding, it simply doesn't matter. Because there's no way that you say, oh, the code looks great with all of this in the middle of it. It is the human mechanism that stops somebody from piercing this veil. And so the problem that we see is that when you're working within a closed context, say within a company, you have some perhaps top-down hierarchical code review process. You have some way to say, look, we're not going to enforce certain things from a mechanical perspective. We're not going to use PEP40 for type hinting. We're not going to use, you know, really strict linters. We're not going to use auto for code formatting. You know, we may not even use these sophisticated information hiding mechanisms. Instead, we use our code review process because we can guarantee that code only has production if it goes through code review. And that's a very reasonable thing to do. Now, with that said, there's one thing that I want to I want to share with you one, one thought that I was. I was talking to somebody who had a lot of experience working with restaurants. And they said, you know, you know, the only place you can find a spotless kitchen is in a restaurant that has no customers. And I thought that's very similar to a situation that I've seen in software, which is the only time I've ever seen perfect code is if nobody really used it. Because necessarily any code that people are actively using, where that code is really important to some task, where that task is in some competitive market is always being pushed to its extent. You write some code, you think it's perfect, and your boss says, well, our competitor has the same functionality. I need to make this functionality scale 10 times. Oh, our competitor has this functionality. We need to go into this particular market. So I need your code to handle all these edge cases that you assumed in the underlying design were not things that you wanted to consider. And so any code that's actually very important is always going to be in this unstable mode where it's being pushed beyond its limits. And so there's always going to be some kind of broken code. There's always going to be some issues with the underlying code that there's always going to be some desire to take some perfect API that you've created and to subvert it. Because you may provide your API to some users that gives them some set of functionality. And the moment that they are satisfied with implementing some analysis with that functionality, somebody's going to say, we need you to scale this 10 times. We need to handle this use case or this is business case or this sector that you didn't deal with originally. And they're going to be pushed to push your code beyond its limits. They're going to be pushed to pierce this veil and to do things that you never intended them for them to do with that code. And so it leads us to a couple of lessons. Because you can't have ad button, you cannot avoid that code, and you cannot avoid people misusing code that you provide them, misusing your APIs, you must take a more permissive attitude to this. Number one. All of these sophisticated techniques that we saw for information hiding, 
putting things deeper and deeper and raising the bar. They don't work because a sufficiently motivated grad student with infinite time and no self-respect and nothing better to do with their time, they're going to find a way around this. So you might as well use the most basic technique because it keeps your life easier and no matter what you do, they're going to break it. Number two, if you do not maintain constant communication with your users to understand why they are breaking your code, if you see some misuse of your code and you say, no, that's wrong, you need to use it this way, that's not going to lead in the right direction. If your users are misusing your code, they're doing it for a reason because they have some sort of pressure to accomplish something that your code didn't originally, wasn't originally designed to do. And unless you have that constant communication and you're constantly speaking to them saying, what did I not provide you? You're going to be blindsided with, you make some fundamental change and then suddenly they say, look, we've been using this code and it's critical to our operations and we peek behind some of the implementation details to do things that you never intended for us to do because that's what we were pressured to do by our own business requirements. Similarly, when you write your code, if you write your code in the same mode as say something like Pandas or MatPub, we have many, many, many layers. You have a convenience layer and many convenience layers now. And one benefit of that is it does obscure where the implementation is. The deeper, say, the function call stack is between where the user interacts with their code at the API level and where the implementation is, the harder it is for them to actually figure out where to change things and to pierce that gap. And the more rigidity that you add to your code, and so the less likely they're going to be successful at misusing this API. But the problem there is you actually want your users to misuse your code. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to misuse your code because then they will use your code. If somebody is not using your library to do something they're not supposed to do, it probably means your library is not that useful at all anyway, right? It's just like a spotless kitchen is a restaurant that has no customers. If nobody is trying to do things with your code you didn't intend to do, it's because your code wasn't, wasn't that useful in the first place. And so when you design your APIs, when you design your libraries, keep them very shallow. Make it easy for somebody to figure out where the implementation detail is and to subvert that implementation detail and make it as easy as possible for them to subvert that implementation detail because the deeper you make that code, the more layers that they're going to have to go through in order to subvert this and the more complexity you're going to add when they inevitably do that and some underlying implementation change causes them to complain to you on GitHub. Similarly, instead of trying to avoid misuse, accept that it will happen and embrace it. Find ways to make it easier for them to appropriately misuse your code. This is something that I like a lot about Python. Python is a very rich language from an engineering perspective. Python is full of safety valves and escape hatches where if you need to do something with Python that you weren't really supposed to do, that you weren't really intended to do, Throughout the sys module, throughout the standard library, there are all sorts of ways that you can subvert assumptions that core Python works, that the standard library works. And you're expected to do that because in an actual industrial setting, there's always going to be something that the underlying API library language designer did not intend. And by providing you with a safe escape hatch or a safe, a safe or safety valve, you can at least channel that energy away from somebody trying something weird like you know, tuple set items. Additionally, when you're designing an API, anticipate you will get something wrong. There is necessarily some corner case you won't consider, some U case you will not consider. And so anticipate that since you're going to get things wrong, make it easy for somebody to go in and work around something that you did incorrectly. Do not be too rigid with your users about this must be used in this way. You have to call these functions this way. You have to use this API in this way. Otherwise, it's wrong. You might be tempted to do that if you're in a situation where you can code review every code because you can block them from pushing to production but that's just going to create frustration of your end users and they're going to find a way. You know what they're going to do? If, you, if you're if you really rigid in code reviews and every time somebody uses an API wrong, I've seen this with big platform projects and some of the big banks. People would use the API slightly wrong and then the core team would come and they would complain, no, you have to use this API in this particular way. I have to use the platform in this particular way. You know what you do? You just make your code reviews really, really big because then the code reviewer doesn't have enough time to read through all of it and they have enough to do in their own job and so they'll just scan through it and you'll be able to hide stuff that they didn't intend. So you'll subvert the code review process because your boss told you, I need you to get this functionality done by, you know, by the end of the week. And you'll have found a way to do it. And that way will involve subverting the API. And so with that said, I, I hope, I know this is somewhat of a meandering, a meandering trip through some discussions of what you can do with Python, how you can try to do information hiding, why it's folly. But I hope from this talk, 
it's given you a little bit of thought into what happens when you are tasked with designing an API or designing a language or designing a platform. Anticipate that you'll get things wrong because if you're writing this in Python, no matter what you do, no matter where you put the implementation details, no matter how you hide things, because an underlying Python user can just run that code and because Python has such a rich runtime, because they can run it, there is nothing you can hide. There's nothing you can stop them from doing. There's nothing you can stop them from subverting. So be prepared for that. Be ready for that. Make it something that you can accommodate. Understand that you're going to get things wrong. And then you'll be able to sleep at night. Thank you so much.